Love, uh, for love for most people is this concept whereby it's this emotional rush. It is this chemical high. That's not love. That's addiction. And that's why there are, you know, there are treatments for love addiction. There are treatments for you know, people that are what's called codependent because they become addicted to being in relationship and proximity to others. To me, love is about understanding the duality of life. Everybody has good personality traits. Everybody has bad personality traits. Most people in the early stages of a relationship are really good at hiding their bad personality traits. And most people in the early stages of a relationship are really good at ignoring bad personality traits because they're focusing on all the good personality traits. But then you reach this time of saturation where you've looked at all their good personality traits and you've been holding in that fart for six months. <laughs> and then one day, you just let it all out. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they go from, ah. Oh, love watching you sleep. You've got this little whistle that your nose does when you sleep. I just love that. To sitting there with a pillow while you sleep going, if you fucking whistles one more time, I'm going to fucking smother him. We laugh because it's fucking true. See, real relationships come when we have the ability to connect at a level that goes beyond judgment. And judgment is a psychological concept where we determine what's good and what's bad. Love, to me, is the synthesis of complementary opposites seen in synchronicity. It's where you can see both the good in someone, personality traits, behaviors, expressions, the bad in someone, personality traits, behaviors, and expressions, simultaneously and be accepting. Because that's life. Life is dual. There is a duality to everything. There's a duality to every particle in your being, every particle in that desk, every particle in your phone and your drink right now. And you accept it unconditionally because there is no psychological reflection. But it's not until you get the proximity of others where you get this concept called projection and reflection, where we see the reflection and the projection of self and others, and then judgment comes in. But 90% 90, 90 of that judgment is self-projected. Self-unacceptance. Whereas if you can learn how to master your relationship with self, Oh my God, it becomes so much easier to accept others. And the pathway to accepting others and connecting with others at the highest level is connecting and accepting self. You're flawed. You're fucking human, okay? There are good parts to your personality and there are bad parts to your personality. You can either love it and accept it or you can judge it and hate it and that'll be what you reflect and project when you meet other people that trigger you. And the other people who will trigger you are there by design to show you what work needs to be done. And here's the thing we've got to understand. This is for everybody when it comes to trauma bonding. Trauma bonding is, a, is normally a trait that is very, is very characteristic in codependent dynamics. Trauma bonding in most cases creates a level of chemistry whereby when you're with someone, they make you feel a certain way. And oftentimes what we can do in personal and intimate relationships is we can mistake chemistry for actual compatibility. And so as a result, sometimes we can meet new people, meet new friends, meet new clients, and we go, oh my God, there's this mad connection. And it's like, well, hang on, is it really a connection or is it just chemicals? Are you connecting based on genuine compatibility, based on genuine shared traits and shared experiences? Or are you allowing the chemistry of the dynamic, the charge? And we've all experienced this. Most of us have probably experienced this on a sexual nature where we've met someone. There's been enormous chemistry, great sexual charge, but then we explore the relationship. And once the sexual chemistry dies down, there's nothing left. And often what we're left with is dysfunctional relating, dysfunctional communication. But we threw ourselves into the connection because there was this mad chemistry and they just made me feel like people have never made me felt before. But when we look at what the roots of trauma bonding is, it's paternal and looking at, okay, who paternally made me feel safe and what was that dynamic? And when we start understanding that, we start realizing where chemistry comes from. Chemistry comes from when we recognize energetic traits and energetic patterns in others that were shared by our paternal parents or our paternal protectors. And even if it's highly dysfunctional, as a child, if you've got a paternal parent that's taking care of you, even if you're being abused, that's your definition of safety. That is your definition of home. And that is your definition of love, no matter how dysfunctional that appears to the outside world. And so people ask the question, why do you keep going for bad guys? I don't know. But that's how you experience love.
Why do you keep going for bad girls? I don't know. Why do you keep going for people to take advantage of you? I don't know. Like to give you context, I literally had this awareness only in the last week in reflection based on a whole bunch of previous relationships. Like, and again, I'm going to go pretty deep here with you guys. Like, my mother is a beautiful soul and I am so grateful that I was given her as my mum. But one of the things I identified through our relationship is my mum looked at financial advantage as a way of survival. Because to her, that was how she survived. Because she, on some level, didn't believe she could survive any other way unless she could find a way to take financial advantage of a bad situation. Now, sure enough, when I look at the first half a dozen of my serious relationships, what were they? They were with women who were looking at me as a way to survive financially. And even though others and people could see that, man, I don't know if this chick's really with you for the right reasons. To me, it was like, no, no, it's fine. I know there's a connection there. But what I was connecting to was the chemistry of that paternal love that chemistry of that paternal safety, because that's, to my mind, to my neurology, to my energetic blueprint, that was how I felt loved, was by being with a woman who looked for financial advantage as a way to survive, because that was her survival strategy. Now, as weird as that sounds, when I realized this only about a week ago, because I was literally going through all my trauma bonds and I was looking at patterns and I was doing some NET, I was like, holy shit. I legitimately have a mad attraction for, in some cases, women who are looking for financial advantage. And for years, I couldn't work out why. Why am I sometimes attracted to people who just want to take advantage of me? I have no fucking idea. Couldn't work it out. And then when the penny dropped, I was like, oh my God, it's the energetic blueprint of my mum. Now, I'm not attracted to my mum, but anyone who knows anything about you know, parental, paternal and relationship dynamics, we often go seeking you know, those partnerships, those dynamics that we had or that we feel were missing uh, when we were kids. And so for me, a big part of this journey is actually being able to be conscious enough in either intimate or personal dynamics to go, wow, there's a real connection here, but then ask the question, okay, what's driving this? Is this a chemistry connection? I.e., am I trauma bonding right now? Or is there a possibility to trauma? Or is there a genuine compatibility here? And so for me, in any relationships that we're exploring, we should always be looking for, oh, don't get me wrong, everybody fucking loves chemistry. Chemistry will start the fire, but compatibility will build a house. Compatibility will create long-term healthy dynamics, okay? And chemistry, although might create lots of feel-good moments and lots of heightened emotions and heightened addictive um, traits, ultimately, it's gonna create some kind of a shortfall where we're gonna feel empty and left out because, yeah, I'm having my chemical needs met, but what about all my other needs? Are they being met as well? The most important thing you can start to do is introduce boundaries, you know, and where those boundaries are and what those boundaries look like really come down to what's important to you. And understanding that when you start putting boundaries in place, that's gonna, in most cases, evoke a response. And it's important when you start putting in those boundaries that you don't own other people's responses and you don't buy into the emotions of other people's responses. And, you know, for me, when I started unraveling my codependence, it started with, I'm just gonna make one promise to myself every day and just follow through on that one promise, okay? And in most cases, that promise related to either doing something for me, okay? Or making sure that I held a boundary and held firm within those boundaries. Because the biggest challenge for codependents when they start putting in boundaries is they feel guilty. And that guilt is amplified by the person, you know, who has, you know, been in that co-relationship. And that guilt is amplified into shame, you know, and that is then leveraged into insecurity and, and emotions get brought into it. And then as a result, we submit and we allow the boundary to fall away. And, you know, when you look at what a codependence is, it's basically you've got two people who come together and they enmesh. Okay, they become one identity. And what you're doing when you unmesh is you're essentially unraveling the joint identity and you're separating that identity. And that can be very difficult and quite painful. But if you've got two people who are very committed to the process, then you're going to have a good talking point. And every time you put in a boundary and you get an emotional response, you know, that's where you go, hey, listen, I'm really feeling for you right now, but you've got to understand this is your response. It's not mine. These are your emotions, not mine. This is my boundary. It's what's important to me. And if you really do love me, then you'll respect my boundaries. But I don't understand why now, why this? Because it's important to me and I've identified this is something that's important to me. And when I sacrifice this, it affects me. It makes me feel less than, and I want to feel more than, and I want to feel more than with you, okay? Not less than with you. 
And I'd rather have a relationship that fulfills me, not drains me in this context. And so one of the things that I'm learning, especially in a new relationship that I'm in, where both of our previous relationships have had co-dynamics in place, it requires an enormous level of conversation, an enormous level of willingness to go, "Uh uh-oh, okay, boundaries in place, trigger, and rather than ignore the trigger and go, fuck, I hope that goes away, fuck, I hope that come down, you go, no, I can see you triggered what's going on for you. Let's talk, let's talk about it. Let's go there, let's explore it, let's talk about it. You know, and you know, my, my, my new partner and I, we have had, gosh, we've only been together maybe six, seven months and we've had probably hundreds of conversations, you know, where I've essentially put in a boundary, okay, or held or upheld a boundary where I'm seeing a boundary creep, I'm seeing the emotion trigger in the other person and I'm going, okay, I can see a triggered. What's going on for you? And then I get to hear their perspective, okay, but then I don't own their perspective. I go, I can understand that's how you feel, but I'm not responsible for your feelings. Okay, I care very deeply about you, okay, but I also care very deeply about me. And that's one thing that when I do that, it makes me feel less than, and I'm just not willing to do that, okay? And so for me, it requires enormous levels of conversation, enormous levels of touch, tough conversation, but enormous levels of being able to hold space during those conversations so you don't end up fighting about an emotion and not the actual boundary. Because what I've discovered is oftentimes when people put in the boundaries, they go, this is my fucking boundary. And they go, why are you talking to me that way? Well, I'm sick of the way that you treat me. Well, you don't have to fucking talk to me about it that way. And then it becomes a fight about how you're talking to each other. And it's not a fight about the boundary. And there doesn't even need to be a fight. And so for me, and that's often what happens in codependence, is when a boundary gets in place, you'll see deflections and distortions come out from fucking everywhere. Well, I don't like the way you put that boundary in place. And you'll, you know, I say, well, hang on. Let's not talk about how you feel. Let's talk about the boundary. But I want to talk about what you said. Well, no, okay. Well, maybe I'll apologize for what I said. No, I'll apologize for how I said it, but I don't apologize for what I said. But let's not get carried away with the secondary goal. Let's not get carried away with the secondary trigger here. Let's talk about what actually created the problem in the first place. And you keep coming back to the problem. Keep coming back to the problem. Keep coming back to the boundary. Keep coming back to the boundary. Uh, And it requires an enormous level of (laughs) uh, concentration to just uphold that boundary and uphold the conversation and keep bringing it back to the actual conversation and not let it get derailed through deflection, distortion, and distraction.